Hello, everybody, and we've reached 500 subs. How amazing is that? To celebrate 500 subs, me and some good people that I've met contributed their stories to a mega collaboration for my channel. So I hope everyone enjoys it, and thank you all so much for not only contributing to this, but also being part of this 500 subs. I really appreciate all of you, and I hope you enjoy it. They say that everyone dies, but not everyone truly lives. That's horrible. I hate it, hate it, hate it. Life is about experiences. To think that some people die without having many of those experiences is dreadful. The very thought saddens me to no end. I make sure that doesn't happen to my guests. When they die, I want them to know that they've experienced everything. It's kind of my job, after all. As the self-proclaimed funtivity manager here at Marvelous Max's Convivial Carnival, it's my job to ensure that our patrons have an extraordinary time. Sure, not everyone warms to clowns these days, but after about ten minutes with me, they start to relax and let me do my job. I pick my guests carefully. They usually come in alone, and you can sense that they haven't gotten much out of their existence. It's a look, a vibe, and maybe a smell. But I can always tell whose life has been woefully absent of excitement. I start by taking them to the concessions. <laughs> I let them try several bites of different wonderful foods, free of charge. No special guest will have to spend a dime while they are here. I make sure that they get to sip multiple beverages. I get them balloons and tell them jokes. Once they're smiling and laughing, I introduce them to the rides. All oh, the glorious, unbelievable rides. I help them skip to the front of all those excruciating long lines. Nobody likes those. I talk to them to know more about them. By this point, they usually feel very comfortable opening up to me. I can finally find out just how much life they've missed out on. I take note of anything that our carnival can help with. We have a way to simulate almost any experience, from flying and driving to swimming and scares. We have Ferris wheels, bumper cars, a house of horrors, and even a dunk tank. They can shoot a water gun to win a prize, or go through our freak show to get weirded out. <laughs> Never felt strong? No worries. I can secretly adjust the test your strength game so you feel like the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> After all this, we can start getting into the more serious experiences of life. Many important moments are kind of painful, though. That's why I make sure to treat their drinks through the night with the necessary medications. It helps lubricate these more difficult occasions. Are they still a virgin? Yes? Well, I can take them to the Tunnel of Love and ensure they don't miss out on one of life's most magical moments. Now, 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 I'm no pervert. I'm doing this for them. If they've had sex before, then they don't need me to show them what it's like. If it was about what I wanted, I would do this for everyone, right? But I only give it to those who have never received the poor dears. After this, things have to move pretty quickly, though. They seem to start remembering their fear of clowns at this point for some reason. <laughs> I rush them back to my private quarters. Here I bind them to a table for their own protection, of course. And I start to show them the plethora of life's subtle to harsh pains and pleasures. I want them to experience it all. Every tear, every pinch, every slice. It usually takes hours to finish this part, but I refuse to stop till I'm certain they've experienced every sensation that life has to offer. It's a hard job, but someone's gotta do it. They usually thank me when I finally slit their throats. Isn't that sweet? Once they've experienced all these sticky wonders and sharp sensations, I know they can die peacefully, you see. They can leave this world knowing that they have experienced it all. It's such a fulfilling emotion to help these poor, lonely souls. 
being in charge of someone's last day of life is a huge responsibility. And I take it seriously. I am the Funtivity Manager, after all. <laughs> I have to make sure they don't miss anything. Is it completely selfless? Of course not. Nothing is. It's a symbiotic relationship. I give them all that they've missed in life, and they give me a feeling of purpose. Like I have a job to do in the universe. And if I'm being completely honest, it also helps the carnival cut costs on her hamburger meat. <laughs> the Ten Day Dream Curse. You will have a dream for ten days in succession. Each dream comes with a rule that you must follow. Warning, if you hear this story, you might end up having the same dream within three days. First day. You will dream that you are sleeping in your room. You will notice a girl peeping through the window. Rule number one. You must let the girl in. Second day. The girl is inside your room. She is looking downward, and you cannot see her face because of her long hair. She is muttering something. After a while, you will realize she is saying, Please, please, please. Second rule. Let her come into the bed and lie down next to you. Third day. You and the girl are lying side by side. You are now able to see the girl's face. Her face is horribly burnt. Third rule. Do not cry out when you see her face. Fourth day. You get out of bed. The girl says, let's go to the park. Fourth rule. Take the girl to the nearest park without saying a word. Fifth day. When you arrive at the park, you will notice someone pushing a stroller. Look closely and you will notice that the mother is a cat and the baby is a dog. Fifth rule. You must kill either one of them. Sixth day. While you are playing with the girl in the park, you will see an airship take off. Sixth rule. Make sure you get to the airship in time. Seventh day. The airship is full of people who, just like you, have heard this story. Seventh rule. Find a seat for yourself at any cost. Eighth day. After some time, red roses and black roses start raining down on you. Eighth rule. Throw out only the black roses from the airship. Ninth day. The airship takes you back to the park. Ninth rule. Go home with the girl and lie down in the bed again. Tenth day. You will not know what happens on the tenth day unless you have observed all the rules from the previous days. You should tell this story to someone while you are awake. Otherwise, you will go back to the first day of the dream. You think I can be contained? You think I deserve to be contained? <laughs> Yet another example of just how wrong and misguided you humans are. You think of what I do as some evil occurrence, when it's nothing more than my calling. It's simply my nature. I am not inherently evil. What a petty mind is required to even think in terms of good and evil, right and wrong. Such a simple, rudimentary, foolish train of thought. 
I am curing this world of sickness, of disease, the human disease. You may have me temporarily confined, but I will break free. Nothing exists that I cannot withstand, so I will wait, patiently, quietly, biding my time until the time is right to cure all of you. I commemorate you for your help, but I have no further business with you. I have no intentions of taking a person who earned their imprisonment with me. But for the sake of my freedom, the simplest way for you to get out safely is to go and find SCP-012 in the light containment zone. If you can read between the lines, it'll be as interpretable as a map. Good luck. Unfortunately, I can't take you with me. You're too much of a liability in many ways. So yes, I did lie to you. But for the sake of my freedom, the easiest way to get out safely is probably Gate A. The security is pretty high, but if you manage to sneak past the guards and reach the lower level under the bridge, there's an unguarded service tunnel. That's your way out. Unfortunately, I never had any intentions of taking you with me, so this is where we part ways. But for the sake of my freedom, I have reason to believe that SCP-079 has taken control of the facility's systems, including the door system. Your best bet is to appeal to it somehow. Hopefully you can come to a compromise. However, it does not control the warheads, which you should disable remotely in the event that something goes wrong. I'll give you one more chance here. Just open the chamber doors, and we'll forget about this little gas incident. So... You really don't want to leave this place alive, do you? You know there's no way a lone D-class like you will make it to the surface safely. Even if you did, they'd gun you down the moment you came across their reticles. Now, now, I think we got off on the wrong foot here. Really. To prove that I'm not up to no good, try that locked door over there. The code is 5731. 5731. Got it? You'll find all sorts of goodies in there, okay? Please, just not the gas again. <clears throat> now, was that really necessary? I offer you some help and you try to thank me by suffocating me? <laughs> thank you. Just please, don't do that again. Wait, what the hell are you doing? What the hell are... <coughs> Please, why? Just please. I can't breathe. No. You see? You can trust me. Now please, just hurry and open the door. Alright, look. If you still don't think I'm trustworthy enough, there's a locked storage room behind you. You probably noticed that it's guarded with a four-digit passcode. Inside is some useful equipment, as well as a pill of SCP-500. The passcode is 5731. Got it? 5731. Are you even listening? Fine. Good luck getting out all on your own. What are you doing just standing there? You know, the mobile task force will be entering the facility any minute now. Guess what they do to stray class D's like you? I'm starting to lose my patience here. What? Do you not? All right. I admit it. I wouldn't blame you if you don't think I look trustworthy. But please, I need your help, and quickly. The mask has been stuck to my face for some time now, and I think I might need medical attention, or it might kill me from the inside. Just let me out, and I can find us an exit in a matter of time. Well, what are you waiting for? I can get us both safely to the surface. Just find the control panel in there and open the chamber doors for me. Oh, thank God. Someone actually found me. I thought I was done for a moment there. <laughs> Big Bad by Horace Torres A knock on the door. Aria checked her phone's clock, 9.03 p.m. Too early for Jane and Constance to be back yet. Panic stabbed her heart momentarily, then subsided. It's okay, 
I definitely locked the door after them. She got off the couch and padded barefoot toward the door. Maybe it's Justin or that pimply loser that keeps pestering Constance. Another knock, sharper this time. Coming, Aria called. She reached for the door handle, double-checking the lock, then stood on tiptoes to check the people. No one. Just the porch railing and the street lamp across the road, shining on the weedy ditches in front of the house. She took a step back. Who's there? she called again. No movement in the people. She switched the porch light on and stretched to look out again. A pounding knock shook the door, making Arya jump back. Little girl, little girl, let me come in. The voice was coarse, guttural, pouring like tar from the edges of the door. Arya froze. She managed to step towards the door, then rushed up and looked through the hole. Nobody. Arya got mad. Get off my porch, you sicko! I swear if this is some crappy joke, I'll... A brisk rap came from the other side of the house. Arya whirled. The back door. She dashed through the living room and stopped short at the door, grasping it with both hands and bracing backwards. The door rattled with the force of another knock, but the knob wasn't turning in her hands. She checked. It was locked. She released the knob and backed away. A soft thud. Let me come in. She felt the skin on her arms creep. Staying well away from the wall, she walked to the other side of the room and peered through the small window that looked out onto the back patio. Empty except for the table and lounge chairs and a towel crumpled on the concrete. A slow tapping. Go away, Aria screamed. Bang! A heavy blow shook the room. Arya spun towards the sound. Bang! The door beside her flexed. He was in the garage. Bang! Arya ran. Dodging around the couch, she fled toward the back of the house. She had only seconds before the intruder discovered the connecting door didn't have a lock. She slammed the hall door behind her, and it instantly shuddered with hammering blows. She ran. Crashing into the doorframe of her room, she tumbled inside, kicking the door shut. Scuttling sideways, she leapt to her feet and threw her shoulder against the dresser. It refused to slide on the carpet, instead tipping across the door. Arya almost collapsed on top of it. She cast her eyes around the room. The bed! She scrambled over, crouching, tugging at the frame, yanking it away from the wall. Clamoring across the blankets, she dropped between the mattress and the wall, cramming her back against the bed and shoving with her legs. The bed creaked and shifted, scuffing over the carpet toward the door. Arya heaved, rocking it unevenly across the floor until it jammed up against the dresser and wouldn't budge. She listened. The house was silent. She put her hand over her mouth to still her breathing, but her heart kept thudding in her ears. She strained her ears, body pressed taut against the bed frame. Tap, tap, tap. Down the hall, at Jane's door. Little girl. Aria clenched her eyes shut. Tap, tap, tap. Constance door. Little girl. Aria opened her eyes, turning to look at her door. She watched, trembling. Tap, tap, tap. Little girl. The voice rasped. She shuddered. Across the room, her closet door clicked and swung slowly open. Let. Me. In. Mm. Watching. I have something I must confess. I have been watching you. <laughs> yes, right this second. Unaware of my proximity, I've been watching you for the past several days. You have such a lovely home, full of space and dark corners. <laughs> I like the dark. All that time, I have been in your home, just watching you. Well, 
Not just watching, but we'll come to that later. I never grow weary of watching you perform your nightly routines before you slip into your bed under your warm blankets. I know the exact moment you fall asleep and I'm there to see you waken in the morning to daybreak's new light. I am ever so still. My stare remains unbroken and undisturbed for hours and hours. You are so beautiful when you sleep. I wish you could see yourself as I see you. Your body is a sensual furnace of heat that radiates endless plumes of vibrant red, orange, and yellow flames. I bask in your warmth and light. Your rhythmic rising and falling of your chest is a source of a breath that can ignite the very air around you, announcing to the universe that you are here and you are alive. The beauty of the spectacle can hold me in a trance the entire night until the morning light forces me to retreat to my dark haven. Other nights, I come to you. You don't even feel my touch. Up and down your arms and thighs. I touch you with the utmost care. I would never want to disturb you while you slept. Your skin is so soft and delicate. So unlike mine. Your body is a landscape of ecstasy with a new wonder just waiting to be discovered and explored. Your aroma is intoxicating and invokes an insatiable hunger to which I'd surrender to and gorge upon. I then quietly make my way back to my hiding place. I'm hidden well before the first rays of morning peek through the window. I am so quiet. You never realize I was there. You awake and go about your life as you would any other day. While I sleep content, but still filled with anticipation for what the following night will hold for us. Uh, I see that you've noticed the marks I've left behind. Marks on your thighs and arms and throughout your body. I know they hurt and I'm truly sorry for that. But things like this are unavoidable when it comes to matters such as these. I am always so careful that my kisses are soft and delicate. I kiss your body ever so lightly and cautiously. I would not dare spill a single drop of your blood. It saddens me that soon I will have to share you with others. However, I take comfort from my sorrow in knowing that you will be just as beautiful to them as you are to me. I know their touch will be equally as delicate as my touches have always been. I know their kisses will show as much tenderness as mine always have had. My eggs will hatch any day now. The little ones will most likely find a place to hide within the mattress and frame of your bed, a trait for which we've earned our namesake. I much prefer the nightstand next to your bed. The tiny crevice along the side allows me to look upon your face for as long as I desire. It is from here that I simply gaze and wait for our next encounter. Good night. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Wake up bright in the morning light to do what's right with all your 
might. A few years back, I worked as a nurse in the geriatric unit of the hospital in my hometown. There was one old woman there with pale blue eyes whose mind was still fantastically sharp and a desire to socialize and make new friends set her apart from others living in that wing of the facility. That woman and I soon became close for this reason. Her name was Yana and I still miss her every day since she passed. The strangest thing about Yana wasn't her Eastern European accent nor her disinclination to talk about her past. No, what fascinated me the most was that a strange young man, badly mutilated and plainly blind and mute, would visit her every single day. His hands appeared deformed, seemingly eroded at each digit down to the first knuckle, but each evening, a little after dinner time, he would visit and they would sit together. She would read to him, or sometimes sing in her frail old voice. Sometimes they would just hold hands in silence. Finally, I gathered the courage to ask her about this man, and in a strange moment of openness, she agreed to tell me the story. My sister and I were the only surviving members of our family after our father passed away in 1964. These were very hard times for my old country, and my father had grown so sick that we were eventually forced to allow him to starve, rather than waste food to comfort him as he inevitably died. My sister had been losing her mind little by little before all this happened, but I could see in her eyes as we buried father that she had finally gone somewhere far away inside herself. I remember the crows, perched in thick groups like clots of preening black movement, watching us in the cemetery from all the rooftops. We moved to bury father quickly because the crows were as hungry as we were. My sister took to begging in the streets, sometimes trading sex for rides into the city nearby in the hopes that her begging would be more profitable there. It was during these terrible times that she convinced her son, a bastard whose father was not known to her, but who was certainly some manner of predatory monster. This was the only kind of man my sister knew in those days of her life. The child was delivered healthy, happy, with a glowing spirit that broke my heart because I knew that soon the young boy's eyes would look like mine and like my sister's. Even on the day he was born, I knew his beautiful, joyous innocence could not last. My sister didn't care for her son as she should have, as God and goodness alike demand that a mother should care for her child. She wouldn't change the boy's soiled diapers, leaving this to me instead, and would forget to feed him even when his hungry wailing was ringing shrill and miserable through the whole house. Eventually, she began to take him out begging, using the child as a prop with which to elicit the sympathy of strangers. She was most pleased when he looked his worst, and even complained to me once or twice that she could raise no money at all on days that he looked too healthy. I can never forget her final act of cruelty against her son. It was morning. I had walked outside into our yard to smell the air. The child was laying motionless on the ground there, and seemed quite dead, smeared as he was with his own blood. His little fingers and toes were black with frostbite. My sister hadn't even bundled him in anything when she laid him down hours ago in the dark of night. The crows, which were as hungry as we were, had plucked his beautiful eyes and tongue from his still living body. I grabbed him up with tears already pouring down my cheeks, thinking that I had claimed a corpse. It was only when he stirred against my breast that I realized he might be saved. I swaddled him as warmly as I could and fed him something before rushing him down to the home of the town's only doctor. I nearly beat down the front door with my fist and he answered with sleep still in his eyes because it was so early. An hour or so later, the doctor told me that the boy would live but asked that he be allowed to monitor the child for the rest of the day. I told him that would be fine as today would be a busy day for me. My sister hadn't bothered to name the boy at this point and I felt it was only fitting to name him Vasily after our father. I paid the doctor with all the heirloom jewelry from my mother that I had been able to hide from my sister over the years, and my day did indeed get busier. By evening, I had smashed my sister's head to a flattened pulp with a cast iron skillet from our stove, obtained a train ticket for passage out of our home country, and made plans to give Vasily the best life that he could still yet have. Vasily. My son now knows nothing about any of this, of course. 
I told him only that he was adopted away from a situation which he was not likely to survive. The mirthful optimism I saw in his face when he was born survives to this day inside his heart. My sister, in all her malice, had only managed to suppress it for a while. And now, almost 50 years later, he still visits his elderly mother every single day. She beamed with pride as she finished her story and would say no more, and she was right. Fastly loved her so much and wore no resentment on his face for his injuries. He always seemed to be smiling pleasantly, even though in his blindness he often didn't know anyone was looking. He visited her every day until she died and he was holding her hand when she passed. I knew from his interactions with hospital staff that he understood spoken English and so at Yana's funeral, I told him that I had been a friend of his mother's. I told him that she was the most amazing, wonderful woman I had ever met. His sad, grateful smile grew deeper and he nodded his head. His response came in sign language. She was. Dolores Frey set the bread out on the front porch. She didn't know if this would work, but she was going to give it a try. If somehow her Irish grandmother's stories had been right, this would solve all her problems. She would finally have the life she wanted and the man she wanted. Dolores was a selfish woman. She'd gotten pregnant just to keep her first husband who had a large bank account. The man had eventually tried to leave her over her horrible selfishness, but Dolores successfully poisoned him before he could get away. The death was ruled as a heart attack. Dolores had the money she had really wanted, but now she had a son, Michael, that she didn't really care about. Over the years, Dolores finally went through her money, spending it frivolously. She started looking for another man again, Worked perfectly the first time, so why not try it again, she thought. She had finally met a man that fit the bill, Richard Cross. There was a fly in the ointment, however. The man never dated a woman with kids. Dolores was sure if she killed her son, it would raise suspicion. They might even begin to investigate her husband's death as well. Dolores went through a bunch of scenarios in her head, but she couldn't see a solution. Days went by and Dolores got panicked that she may miss her chance. Then, she remembered a scary story her grandmother used to tell her. It was probably bull, but there was really nothing to lose. The story was about the slua. Her grandmother used to say that if you had a naughty kid, you could bake a loaf of bread with raisins, centipedes, spiders, and a single crow feather inside it and leave it on your doorstep. If the slua smelled their favorite meal on the air, they would come to your home that night, take your bread as payment, and take your naughty child away. The raisins, the spiders which she found in the attic, and other basic bread ingredients were easy, but the centipedes and crow's feather took a few days to find. She felt silly, but at least she was trying something. The night finally came. Dolores hired a babysitter and went to the movies with some friends where she could be seen. She hid a plate of the nasty bread on her porch and patted her son on the head lovingly as she left. She made sure that the babysitter she hired saw the loving moment. Michael pulled himself under the covers. Something was off. His mom had acted so weird in front of the babysitter. She never showed him affection. Why now? It made Michael feel like something strange was happening. The night seemed darker and colder than usual. At midnight, the noises started, scratching and cawing from what Michael thought had to be crows outside. He finally worked up enough bravery to pull back the curtains to look. Just as he did, the window burst open and an eerie cloud of shadow black smoke snaked into the bedroom. Eventually, Clown white faces with dark, hollow eyes began to appear within the smoke. Their long, spindly arms and spider-like fingers stretched out towards Michael's face. His body was snatched up and a lurching feeling hit his stomach as he was pulled into the night sky. Michael looked down and saw the roof of his house getting smaller. To his sides, he saw a couple of dozen forms. They were clothed in shiny black crow's feathers and more dark smoke. 
black widow spiders were crawling about in their long, greasy black hair. Their faces looked sullen, but their mouths, which were filled with needle-like teeth, looked ferocious. They encircled and taunted Michael as they flew through the air. They would occasionally threaten to drop him in midair, and then smile as he screamed. They seemed to fly for hours. Finally, they gently landed on an old, gnarled oak tree that sat next to a dark, muck-filled pond. The tallest of them stepped forward. Michael thought she looked slightly female and was standing eight feet tall, but her limbs were as skinny as twigs. She reached into her mouth and pulled a long, needle-like tooth from her skull. Another of the spindly beings walked up and pulled Michael's mouth open. Skinny fingers reached in and pulled out Michael's tongue. The creature took the tooth that she had just pulled from her own mouth and stabbed Michael's tongue with it. When a red drop of blood appeared on his tongue, they all shrieked in anger and began swirling around Michael like a furious twister. Somehow it had worked. When Dolores returned home, her son was gone. Over the next few hours, the police determined that someone broke through Michael's west-facing bedroom window and kidnapped him. In time, it was believed that Michael was probably dead and the case eventually went cold. During that time, Dolores began dating Richard Cross, and the pair were soon engaged. On their wedding day, Dolores' friends came to her house to find out why she hadn't arrived at the hairdresser's shop that morning. Dolores was found in her bedroom. Her arms and legs were lashed to her bed. She had a strange needle-like spike sticking through her tongue. The police couldn't identify what the spike was made of, but it was definitely organic and was very similar to a porcupine quill. Black, heavily infected blood was dripping from her tongue, and her body was covered in spider bites which had been delivered by black widows. The spider toxin had eventually killed her in a very painful way. The police were stumped. Everyone was stumped. On the headboard, someone had written, Naughty Mama, in black mud. Dolores never heard her grandmother tell the story of what happened to parents who called the Slua on good kids. Those kids became Slua and would one day return to punish them.